Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, usually I'm not in clinic or I, Mondays are always my clinic day. So I didn't realize when I moved from one room to the next, I would lose internet connectivity and it, it gave me a little trouble. So I had to move back to a patient room, but uh, thank you for your patience with me um, today. It's a pleasure um, to speak um, to all of you. Um, and I understand that many of you, many of you are clergy persons um, or in uh, positions of responsibility responsibility with various types of, of congregants. And um, I'm gl glad that you're here um, to um, join in this conversation. So with that, um, I would like to, to share my screen. And I, um, I have a, um, um, some prepared um, comments that I'd like to start with today. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Let me go to, um, here we go. Okay, so I was asked um, um, by B and Jennifer to talk a little bit about COVID-19 vaccines, kind of where we are and what role vaccine um, hesitancy um, really is playing right now. Um, first, want to tell you I'm not a speaker for any, any pharmaceutical. I have not ever been. Um, I have been director of the, vac of the uh, immunization project at Texas Children's for gosh, 21 years, something like that, much predating COVID, and have always tried to keep any uh, relevant conflicts of interest um, uh, uh, unavailable to me so that I can speak about, about vaccines openly and honestly. Um, and I will try to use generic names when possible. Sometimes that's a little more confusing when a question may be around a specific brand name. So um, just to, to tell, kind of go over where we are um, with COVID, I know we are all two, a full two years into this. It seems like the longest and the shortest two years of my life. Um, and just wanted to remind you all that right about now, um, we were just kind of getting over um, our spring break that was held at home. That was sort of wave one in Houston. Um, if you will look, we had another wave in, in summer of, our, of 2020. Um, and then we um, moved into another wave that occurred right at Christmas of 2020, 2021. We thought we were doing really well last summer until Delta showed up in August and this last big peak here has been Omicron. And so we have been in this delightful little, little low phase right now that um, I think we have all been very happy to be in. I was um, happy to be on a plane yesterday and um, most of that plane was taking advantage of the low, uh, the, the low um, amounts of disease that we have. So uh, thankfully we've seen vaccines and vaccines have been here for um, 15, 16 months now. That was a dream at the beginning, but they've certainly been here. And just to go over a little bit of the timeline with you, we had those 15, 16 months ago for adults that were slowly phased in. We got our younger persons 12 to 15 starting at the end of last school year. So it's been almost a year for them. Some got boosted in the fall. Um, we added our younger children on at the end of October when those studies became available. Boosters for all about Thanksgiving of this past year um, and then added to that team boosters and not to confuse things more, but at the end of March, we got the second boosters. So there's been just so many phases of this to keep up with. It's certainly been difficult. Millions and millions um, and billions of doses of, of vaccine have been given worldwide. You can see um, that we had the huge uptake in the, and this is daily doses, 4 million sometimes a day being administered. Um, when we had the second um, boosting um, full recommendation, we had another big blip. But you can see even with this, uh, this another booster for 50 plus a much smaller, smaller increase. Terminology has gotten confusing. So if you feel like you've gotten a little behind the eight ball, join a big group. Um, and so CDC has actually put out some terminology. So I'm gonna say, go through this just to make sure we're all on the same page. So primary series for people who got the Moderna um, or the Pfizer vaccine are mRNA vaccines. Um, and you are an otherwise healthy person. If you'll remember, we got two doses three weeks apart two doses, three weeks apart. If you're someone with whose immune system doesn't work well, they early on said, hey, you guys need an additional dose. And that's your third dose to be part of your primary series. 
So that's all primary series. Um, booster doses is what happens when we know your, your immunity has waned um, and we wanna restore that immunity to what it was in the, in the very beginning. And so they realized pretty quickly on that we were seeing some of that declining immunity and we give you that booster dose and bam, you're right back up where we want you to be. So a booster dose is a subsequent dose to restore protection you had at the beginning. So our initial boosters, what they said six months apart, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the timing. Um, some people get the same product for all the, both of the primary series and that booster dose. Some people wanna do the mix and match we can talk about benefits of that also and do something different than they did before. But really you're up to date. If you've had the doses in the primary series, which would have been two of the mRNA, and if you're not immunocompromised, one booster, that is still up to date. You don't have to have the second booster to be up to date. So how are we doing nationally towards vaccination? This is data um, that I actually pulled yesterday. And as you can see, the red line of the people who have had one dose. So we're pushing 80% of our population has had a single dose. It also leaves about 20, 25% of our population without any dose at all. Um, fully vaccinated, a little far behind that. So again, to be fully vaccinated, you've had your, your two doses. That's the blue line. So mm, over about two thirds of people still there, but not as much as we'd want. And then that booster dose, you can see the booster dose is the purple line. So people did those first two and a lot of people have said then, you know what, maybe, maybe the booster dose isn't for me. Excuse me. Whoops, I didn't mean to go backwards here. So boosters. Um, you know, why? I've mentioned it already. We've got waning immunity over time. Um, some people have chosen to do the same dose, and that would be to use brand names, Pfizer, Pfizer, for the first two that are three weeks apart, and then another Pfizer. Um, some, some of the studies have shown that actually doing a Moderna, um, which would have been different than your first two Pfizer's, can give you a better boost. The vaccines are very, very, very much the same, a little bit different. The Moderna all along has, ha has been a 50 microgram dose versus a 30 microgram dose. So it's a little bit more that you're being exposed to. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I'm going to share with you what I did myself. So I was at Texas Children's the day that the boosters became available, and um, I boosted um, with the same product um, with Pfizer. And sure enough, when the fourth dose became available, I'm here at Texas Children's, it's easy for me to do. So I picked what's convenient. Um, I've, it's going to boost up my immunity. Um, if I wanted to do something different, I easily could have gone to a Walgreens and found a Moderna dose and done what's called heterologous or mix and match boosting. I will tell you if it's inconvenient for, for you to mix and match, then just go ahead and match. Um, and I, because I think the difference is probably very small. Um, they've changed the timing on it. Um, when um, the first booster after your first two doses is five months. Um, used to be six months, it's five months. And then for that fourth dose or that second booster, it's four months after your first booster. So it's gotten kind of confusing. So two doses, five months, first booster, four months, second booster. Um, you know, I've, I've had the question, should I wait? Should I like game the system and try to wait to see if we're gonna see the virus again in the fall? So we know that coronaviruses, the coronaviruses that have caused the common cold for many years tend to be, um, um, to spread more in the winter time. So some people thought, hmm, I'm gonna game the system and wait for my fourth dose until then. And I, I wanna tell you all, it's really like looking in a crystal ball or playing the stock market. If, if you think you've got, you're on that every time, um, great. But it, Delta showed up in the summertime, we know. Um, we got Omicron in the wintertime. We don't know what strain we're going to get. We don't know what properties it's going to have. And we also don't know at that point if we're going to need a, a strain-specific booster in the future. So I will tell you, I would follow CDC recommendations for that. If you're one of those people thinking about your second booster, you're 50 and up, go ahead and get a booster. My guess is this is going to be like influenza vaccine. And what we're going to see is that with new seasons or with new viruses, they're going to need to probably to adjust the vaccines um, to make sure that we've got the best possible immunity that we can have. Um, 
So um, I would say um, go ahead and vaccinate. So I was really brought here today to talk about people, and maybe it's yourself I'm talking to you today, or there's persons in your family or in your congregation that are still just not willing to step into the vaccine game. They don't want a first dose. They don't want to complete their primary series. Um, and really, we're here, we're here to talk about that now. And those persons are what we would consider vaccine hesitant. Um, and those are people who have chosen not to vaccinate um, despite having vaccines widely available to them. And this has become more and more common prior to COVID with routine childhood vaccines um, that people think, you know what, I, I don't really want my kid to have that or even for yourself. Um, maybe you decided you were over 50 and you're like, you know what, I don't think I'm going to be at risk for shingles. I don't think I ever got the chicken pox or was that sick. So why am I going to have this in an adult? And you choose to sit on the sideline. So we're really talking about these, these persons. At the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about persons who were refusing all vaccinations, um, but we're going to really talk about people who are um, just kind of still sitting on the sidelines. So one thing that went bef before we start this conversation, I want to talk a little bit about risk. And we all come into the world with um, a, our own um, predilection for accepting risk. Some people are big risk takers. Let's just say that you are a, a, an oil tycoon and you're going off and you have to decide where to put multi-millions of dollars to drill a well. Well, you're balancing risk deciding to do that. And you're also probably risking a lot of assets to go do that. And that may really charge you up and, and you like to do that. Compared to someone who would you know, never ever even trust a bank with their money and would keep it tucked under their pillow at night um, with armored trucks literally lined up around their house to protect their money in their pillow. Everybody has different amounts of risk that they're willing to accept. And I want you to understand we all, uh, sometimes misperceive risk. I don't know how many of you jump jump in the, your car. Um, I'm, we're in the big city of Houston, Texas, and I grew up in Dallas, Texas. So you might fly down Central Expressway and not think about it in Dallas or fly down Westheimer or a San Felipe in Houston that, that people drive way too fast and not even think about your risk. But we know that your risk of getting in a car accident with, I think in the, on the highways, it says we have you know 4,500 deaths a year in Texas on the highway. And we, we don't even think about that risk when we get in the car, but yet we take off in an airplane. And I can tell you in my family, it's always before someone takes off, they're taking off, love you, um, see you soon. And we all heart back, safe flight. And there may be a prayer associated with that for some of us, but that's a misperception of risk. The car ride is when we should be saying, get down Westheimer safely, you know, mind yourself on Central Expressway compared to that airplane flight when, we, when statistically it's incredibly safe. So we all misperceive this. And so if you're, a, if, if you're a pilot though, and I put you in that airplane, they would know that they are much safer in that plane than they were driving to work that day. But as lay people, we misperceive risk all the time. And that's going to happen when we come into this medical environment. So I think it's important to kind of accept um, that we, we misperceive it and others misperceive it all the time. And then when we go onto the internet, it sort of can, um, it can increase our misperception by something called confirmation bias. So let's just say this. Um, I love coffee. Actually, I don't love coffee. But if you love coffee, and you go onto the internet and you want to say, is coffee good for me? Your eye is going to go to where all the beneficial effects of coffee. And you're going to think, oh, it makes me, you know, more alert. I'm going to increase my metabolic rate. It's going to reduce my risk for this and that um, versus the negative effects. However, if you don't like coffee, you think it's the worst taste in the world, you're going to go look at all the negative effects and call your mom who drinks too much coffee and say, you shouldn't be doing this for all these reasons. So when we go to try to educate ourselves, it's not even balanced because we walk into it with a pre-existing thought or, or knowledge, and then we go try to prove that. So that can be really hard when it comes to vaccines. 
So I think one thing that's absolutely happened and has still happened is perceptions of disease severity. Two years ago, I remember vividly being at home and I almost couldn't watch the evening news without tears coming to my eyes. It was awful to see all of the, the, the dead bodies outside of New York City. And I hope none of you have forgotten about that either. And to see the makeshift morgue in Central Park. Um, now, I, I couldn't, I mean, it was, I, I couldn't believe in my lifetime it was happening, honestly. And that's the lady on the right dying from COVID in our hospitals, which we've had millions of people die from. Unfortunately, there are people that just don't think the disease is that bad because everyone they have known looked like the lady on the left. They got a cold, they may have had very minimal symptoms, um, but they certainly didn't think it was a lady on the right. Now, in my family, um, I actually had a, 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 a cousin's wife who was sick, the, one of the first, you know, hundreds of cases in the U.S. So I got to live that and my husband's uncle died from it. We get that. But unfortunately, there are still people who deny that COVID is a virus killing people. And so it can be very hard and very contentious, even within families, when people don't think this is real. Um, and I, uh, uh, this is very real. So the perception can be everything. Then, you know, some people, if they're not worried about the acute illness, which certainly I've been and I have, um, but they're, they just don't even know what long COVID is. So as a pediatrician, I want to take, put my pediatric hat on and tell you, um, this has been a big concern for us. Um, so kids can get long COVID, but just like adults can. Um, generally, we call it long COVID once you've had symptoms for one to three months after your initial diagnosis. Um, you can have persistent loss of taste and smell, exhaustion, difficulty breathing, difficulty concentrating, sleep problems. These are all things that I would not want any of my three children to have. My youngest is now 16, and I can guarantee you I don't want a 16-year-old with any of these things. Um, now, um, as a pediatrician, we've seen something really bad also, and it's called MISC. And this is um, um, a condition that we see in children two to three weeks after they can even have an asymptomatic COVID infection. Um, and these children start with fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. It doesn't even look like a respiratory syndrome. And what it is, it's an overwhelming immune response that we see throughout their bodies. Um, these children, we now have protocols to catch these kids when they come in because they generally almost look like they've got appendicitis, vomiting, diarrhea. They do all these workup to see if they've got elevator elevated markers of inflammation. And US-wide we've had almost, and this is actually um, as of March 28th, almost 8,000 of these kids have come in and 66 children have died because of MISC. So really whether it's long COVID, um, which estimates uh, are about 25% of people can have long COVID or this more rare but extremely serious MISC, I don't want that. I don't want it for myself. And I certainly don't want it for my children. I don't want it for my patients. So um, people may not you know, know about this. Um, other people have had safety concerns. Um, and I'm gonna time out for a second on safety. One of the questions that I was asked early, um, is the vaccine safe for children? Um, and you know, do are, are any vaccine side effects or risks greater than the disease themselves? So I wanna tell you all throughout the pandemic, I have more than carefully researched all of the studies um, that have come out in children and with the different FDA and CDC recommendations as Pfizer and Moderna have released their studies. These vaccines are incredibly safe. They are incredibly safe. They children. And when we are, um, when they are doing vaccine trials, um, what they do is they studied in older persons, and this is the same for other vaccines that we've seen come out. Um, they study in older persons and they do what they call bridging studies to younger ages. Um, because we know that the human body is the human body. But what we've done with COVID to make sure we didn't have increased side effects, they actually decrease the dose, the number of micrograms. So children in our five to 12 year old range, they only get a third of the dose of the older persons do, but they get a great immune response. And kids' immune systems are very good at producing an immune response. 
So looking through all of these studies, these vaccines have been very safe. I will tell you, I, I put my own daughter in the Moderna trial. Um, it has been very safe. Um, the children who were five to 12 did beautifully. And in fact, what we wanted to see is they didn't have too many side effects. And um, it is misinformation that's out there that, that the side effects of vaccination or even harmful side effects are greater than they are for COVID. That is factually incorrect. And if you look at those studies, and when they're doing the studies, they look at the children who get the vaccine itself and they compare them to um, um, to uh, groups of children um, who don't get the vaccine at all. And they look to see who went to the emergency room in that time frame after the vaccination, who was in a car accident, who had cancer. And they look at any side effect like that. Um, and so these, these vaccines have been incredibly safe. It is not that these children who got vaccinated you know, you know, even a handful. No, not at all. These children did not end up with serious effects, did not end up in emergency rooms, anything like that. So that's misinformation. Um, some, some people have been afraid to vaccinate their children for concerns of infertility. Um, and this was a myth that was put out there pretty early on. Um, and it's actually not a new myth. It was a myth that they used with the HPV vaccine. Um, and the, 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 the place of the myth started um, with a scientist um, over in Europe who claimed that there was a little segment of the, of the virus code um, that was similar to a protein virus, a, a, a code for a protein on the placenta. And that was, that was what they said. And I, one, um, in reading and uh, this little tiny bit of similarity, it's like the comparing you to a criminal in a lineup. You have nothing, you do not look anything like that person. You're a different height, different weight. You might have a different skin complexion. Um, you might be, be totally different, but you're both wearing the same red bracelet. And that is the only similarity between the placental protein um, and the um, actual virus. And so they're completely different. And so that is where this myth came from. There is no risk to your infertility. So children and pregnant women, everyone should get vaccinated. Um, I have two young women, not they, they're not childbearing yet, and I, I'm sure I'm going to be a grandmother, I hope someday. I would never have vaccinated them. There was a shred of truth to this, and there's not a shred. Um, another one is immunity doesn't last. Well, immunity isn't forever with anything. We are teaching your immune system, and we have to sometimes reteach it and reteach it. And that's what we've noticed even with a simple tetanus shot during your lifetime. We have to reboost you. I think people thought years ago that it, like you only got shots when you're a kid. Well, that's not true. You actually have to continue um, to sometimes re-remind your immune system, especially as we age. And I think I've already talked about the vaccine side effects. So some people come to the vaccination table with just bad medical experiences and low trust. And sometimes that can be um, a low trust for reasons such like um, the Tuskegee experiment um, and how African-American persons were, you know, wholly mistreated um, during that process. And then it's not surprising um, would fear the med medicine as an institution. Um, and that we lost the trust of an entire community um, when that happened. So I think we just have to recognize that um, and we have to explain what is happening now and the safety behind which it's happening now. Um, but sometimes I meet individuals who, not for reasons of the Tuskegee experiment, but it could be for other reasons. Let's just say their mom had a hip replacement and it went particularly poorly and they decided that doctors aren't trustworthy and they made a blanket sort of decision about that. I've absolutely seen people come to the pediatric office um, fearing medicine because of adult experiences that they've had. So I think it's important when you're saying, um, you know, I don't know, find out where people are getting their knowledge and um, maybe they just don't trust doctors at all. So really are persons who are vaccine hesitant bad people? Um, and my answer is absolutely not. Absolutely, absolutely not. Many of them think that they are absolutely doing the best thing either for themselves or for their children. Um, their risk perceptions are wrong. 
Um, and we all kind of come to that sort of with a predilection for risk anyway, but they've just got the perception wrong. Many people are grateful for guidance and for, for a trust advisor to step in. And it's really up to us to be patient and persistent because that's really um, where it will pay off. So I've talked a little bit um, about um, vaccine hesitancy and really I like to use this analogy of the tree. And usually when we walk up to a tree, we just see the part right before us. And that could be the, the part that's obvious to you. This person's refusing, this typo, refusing or delaying vaccines or they're delaying all medical care. Sometimes those games hand in hand. But again, it's important for us all to realize all of the feelings, thoughts, um, all of the, the um, sometimes almost gut instincts that are going into people's decision that then result in then what we see. So risk misperception, misinformation, bad experiences, or just fear of medicine. So when you're, if you have the opportunity, if you're a, a clergy person or um, a person of leadership in your congregation, um, start with a positive vaccine discussion. Like um, I just went for my fourth dose and I'm so glad I did. Got a family reunion coming up. I'm really full, looking forward to it. And I'm gonna have my immunity top notch before that. So start with a positive offering about vaccines. They may say, I don't understand why you're doing that. And then you are going to move into active listening. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about a method called the CASE method. And it stands for, it's C-A-S-E, C for corroborate, A for about me, S for science, E for explain advice. And this, um, this method was actually developed by um, Allison Singer. She is the mother of a child with autism. And she really wanted to educate the medical community be it how to talk to people with vaccine concerns. So I'm, I really didn't feel, speak to clergy about how to be an active listener. I should really be learning from all of you about how to be an active listener. Um, this is what your profession does for part of the time. And, but I medically speaking, ask where they got their information. Was it friend, family member? Have they had a prior vaccine reaction or bad health experiences? Um, and then the whole point of this is to build rapport, demonstrate caring and consideration. And really that will be, because often what I find is no one has even ever shown an interest sometimes in how people are really feeling. Um, then move on to corroborate. Um, and corroboration is, has to be carefully done because you don't want to accidentally say what the misinformation they're believing is true. Um, but you can say, I've heard that concern from others. I've read others feel, feel similarly to you so that you can have something to talk to them about in this. You don't want to say, I understand why you would think that. I don't understand it, it's not correct. Or don't say you are right, because they're not right. Um, it's their belief, but it doesn't necessarily make it right. So this is a tricky statement. You've listened carefully. You've got to find some common, common ground um, language to come forward. But then I, I want you all to remember, you are in a position of influence. Um, as a child, I, I grew up um, um, as a Christian, and I can tell you the minister to, to, to me and my family was a most trusted person. And I know in other faith bases, that would be the same. So remember, you're in a position of influence. Take the time and make sure you're sharing and that they know you're sharing truthful information. I would never think any of you would share anything but truthful information. And then you can say something about yourself. And I know many of you participated in weekly or bi-weekly or more seminars. Throughout the pandemic, I participated in multiple webinars and heard from a variety of experts across the TMC. They have explained, I have learned. And again, this isn't to brag, but to ensure them of your credibility that you have be, done your very best to become knowledgeable in this. And then what do you say? Um, and I think many of you know the answers. Many of you know everything I've probably already said today. And it's okay to be that voice. Um, you don't need a doctor to say that necessarily, but you can tell them, I've heard, I've listened, these vaccines are safe. 
Um, and if you don't know the answer, maybe in your congregation, you could establish, are there nurses, physicians, other medical personnel that would be happy to take private conversations with people who, who are interested to get that, have a trusted advisor outside of the medical community because maybe they have distrust. Um, it is important to leave out information that doesn't apply to them. Um, many, we do live in a very self-focused world. So if you say, we want our whole congregation to be safe. Well, most people at this point are really thinking about themselves and it may disappoint you to hear me say that, but that's really the truth. And I've learned to leave that out. Don't talk about other people, talk about them. And then explain advice. Offer to not just make that connection, send the email and say, I'd like to introduce you to so-and-so um, via this email, or maybe offer to, to set the two, of, um, two people up for coffee together, but help make that connection so that person can develop the trust and get the medical information they need. Um, you don't wanna be polarizing, that's never gonna work. You're just gonna lose, you're gonna lose them in that, but you can be confident. You can be confident. We've had billions of these doses given around the world. They are incredibly safe. So know that you can be confident. And don't, don't be afraid of sharing your personal story. Just like I've told you today, I'm on dose four. My husband's had dose four. My kids, because they're not 50 yet, have all had three doses. Share your own personal experience. Some people want to know what you did and are, I want to mi mimic what you did. There are some people that feel you know, very much on the far end of this spectrum. And to leave time for questions, I wanna quickly kind of go through what those may be. Some people may be believing in conspiracy theories. Um, and often when people are kind of conspiracy theorists about science, they may kind of be prone to conspiracy theories throughout their life. Um, and they may believe in certain you know, segments of our community that are working against us and things like this. Again, I think people kind of come into this, this is their sort of their viewpoint in life. Um, it can be much harder to get around conspiracy theory thinking when this is people's pattern of thinking. Some people are, are very afraid of medicine. So just like it, you know, a, a baby shouldn't be bright by a tarantula, it's sort of shocking. You know, it's, we, would, that's, we fear for the baby's life. People feel like this about vaccines in their children or vaccines in themselves. And I had the experience um, oh, probably about eight years ago, I was in an elevator and the flu shots had arrived at Texas Children's for the first day. And I was like, so-and-so come get your flu shot with me. This is the six, three big guy nurse who worked in our clinic. And he looked at me and he said, Dr. Boom, what? And I was like, yeah, we got to go get our shot today. And he goes, I don't do needles. This guy delivered probably 40, 50 shots a day to other people, not himself. I was like, are you kidding me? You're a huge guy, you're coming with me. If I can take the needle, you can take the needle. But some people, it really triggers disgust in them to um, an incredible fear. Hard for me to really relate to, but that's a real thing. Some people are nonconformist, um, you know, because they, um, they don't want other people to be telling them what to do or what to do with their bodies. So even the, by the fact that I may be giving this talk today, they would say, don't tell me how to think. I'm going to think how I want to for myself. Um, and then I already kind of mentioned the individualist worldview. Um, some people are just care about themselves and it's their body. You cannot tell them what to do with their body. And again, heard or helping other people around them is really not what they're thinking about. They're thinking about themselves. So with those sort of folks, if you're a conspiracy theorist, don't ever say some big government agency or some large religious group recommends, um, then it, it's, you can say that these other, these sometimes these conspiracy theorist groups are spreading these to actually convince you. So show them that they, that they they're, the conspiracy theory is actually trying to engulf them. Um, if you want to, if they have fear of medicine, remind them how sick they could be with COVID um, and how they're more likely to be in the ICU. If you're a nonconformist, um, you know, tell them, hey, I, I've looked through this information with skepticism myself because I wanted to make sure the facts were accurate. 
um, and show them that you're a careful thinker and you're not just doing what the group wants you to do. And then finally, if you're an individualist, always make sure that your discussion is only about them and that you care about them and not other people because that will not resonate with that, me or them. So finally, um, vaccine concerns are not new. Um, always try to go with the scientific facts be an active listener, use the case method, um, and then you may have to let tech, um, contextualize what you say based on a person's belief system.